Hey guys, what's up? My name is Florian. This is Wash House TV, and today let's talk about data synchronization. So welcome to this week's episode of Warschau's TV. Um, today I read an article about data synchronization and I found it very interesting. So I want to share some insights with you and um, some knowledge. It's kind of interesting because data synchronization really became a topic in the late 90s um, when devices like the Palm Pilot and the iPod um, came on the market and um, people wanted to sync their data on their peripheral devices. And so the first um, type of uh, data synchronization that I want to talk about is a synchronous peer-to-peer -peer solution, which, for example, uses the iPod um, back in the days with a Firewire cable or uh, nowadays with a USB cable. And um, it's still used today with iTunes and, and the iPod or the iPhone um, via a, a, a Wi-Fi synchronization. This is also still a synchronous peer-to-peer um, approach and it's interesting because um, this is the simplest and most robust solution because um, the way this works is that you actually plug together one device and another peer-to-peer via -peer, um, a cable for example or you use a local network which is available and um, it's very fast local networks are actually really fast and you can also use a, a USB a cable a USB connection which is also very fast and so the whole data set is actually um, copied over to the second device which needs to be synced um, and whenever a change happens, so for example, uh, new music files are available on your Mac, which you want to sync on your iPod, and um, then those files are flagged as new, uh, as changed since the last sync. Um, but the whole synchronization process still copies over the whole data set um, and then actually um, sees those flags, those um, new files, new documents that are changed and um, stores them on the local device that needs to be synced. Um, as I told you, this is very robust. Um, it's guaranteed to have the same data on both devices because they are copied back and forth and to check which files are new. And um, the next thing that I want to talk about is the client-server synchronous approach. So it's also synchronous, but there is a server in between. So when you want to, for example, you want to sync um, calendar data on your iPhone and your Mac, um, you can use a calendar server which um, sits in the middle um, is usually connected um, to the internet and um, this is the very uh, big advantage um, of having a client server approach um, because you have a server in the middle. So the server holds um, the whole truth, holds all data and whenever your iPhone or whenever your Windows phone or whatever mobile device that you want to use um, has a connection to the internet, has a connection uh, to a network, it can pull data off and also push data to the server that you um, enter on your mobile device and then when you came back, um, come back to the computer, um, the computer can pull those changes back from the server. So um, this is a very popular approach um, because um, network speeds approved, especially mobile network speeds approved over time and um, popular cloud services like the Amazon Web Service makes it easy to actually create um, your own web apps that you can use um, in order to sync up data with different devices. Um, but there's also a disadvantage because you have to actually you have to have a, a cloud app which is running on a server and which handles those um, server-side communication. Um, it's always on, it's a very flexible sync um, because there is something in between um, but it's also high cost. So when you want to use a client-server approach um, you have to have a, a web app or something like that so this needs to be developed at first and then you have to have a server running and you have to have uh, transfers um, that you usually pay for and um, so something like a cloud service like Amazon Web Services um, is usually paid um, by bandwidth that is used so the more users you have um, the more you have to pay. Um, it only syncs changes because you need to have um, uh, some some logic going on that you don't um, use too much bandwidth. Um, so not like the 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 peer-to-peer -peer approach where the whole dataset is actually copied over to another device. Um, 
it's only done first. So whenever you have a new device and you want to sync up with the, the, the whole truth on um, the server side, so it's, then all data is pulled from the server. Um, but usually whenever changes happen and changes need to be applied, only those changes are synced up to the server. And um, yeah, the big advantage is that you have a whole truth. So there is a server sitting in the middle and holding all that data um, that can be pulled down to new devices. Um, there's also an asynchronous approach to this. So this was the synchronous side um, where you implement an own web app and handle all the logic on yourself. Um, there's a synchronous approach because um, services like Dropbox actually offer um, Dropbox has a, a so-called drop, uh, how's it called, a data store. Dropbox is actually has a data store API and um, this data store API um, is provided to developers and they can use this in their own apps and their own mobile uh, applications, um, web services, um, and you can sync up data with that data store API. Um, it's asynchronous because um, it's uh, the, the app itself or the service the user is actually using um, is not handling, is not processing the, the synchronization process itself. So you have a data set on your mobile app, for example, and then um, you hand this off to that, um, to that API for Dropbox, for example, and then the Dropbox client itself um, is processing those changes up to the Dropbox server. And um, it's running in the background. Normally, this is done in the background. So you just hand it off. And whenever more changes um, queue up, um, they are handled by the Dropbox API. And it's not happening in real time. And you don't get um, um, data in real time back. So that's why this is asynchronous. And it has a big advantage because um, you are not responsible for, for, um, um, for the process, for the sync process itself. So you don't have to deal with that. Um, but it also has a disadvantage because you, you've tied to a certain vendor. So in that example, you're tied to Dropbox and your users have to use um, Dropbox also. And so there's a, another approach, um, another asynchronous communication um, that uses a peer-to-peer -peer connection. Um, but there is no server. So the way this is actually handled is um, it's especially useful for, for syncing databases where you have large data sets. Um, for example, when you have a calendar app, which has a lot of entries and a lot of events going on. And um, when you want to sync those things up, um, whenever you need to have a, a database synced up, it's the, the best way to actually do this is by using so-called transaction logs. So only changes are pushed to other devices and then the other device is actually seeing that change and importing it to the local store that the device holds. Um, there's a big problem with that because there is no central truth. There is no server in the middle which has that central truth that a new device, for example, um, can pull and um, create a, a local store, a local calendar, for example. And um, the big advantage of this approach, of the asynchronous peer-to-peer -peer approach, is that um, you don't have to have a server logic. You can all handle on. You can handle this on your devices, and you don't have to have uh, a certain vendor. So you only create transaction logs, which are normally text files, and uh, those text files can be synced via Dropbox via iCloud, via Windows, Azure services, uh, via SkyDrive, via Google Drive, uh, whatever basic um, file synchronization service is out there. And there are lots out there that are free to use for users. Um, you can implement this and the user can just sync up with their own Google Drive account and then the synchronization process starts and the whole synchronization logic is handled by um, the mobile app, for example, or by your web app or whatever you, that you are using. Um, problem is that those transaction logs need to be ordered. You know? and they have to have a certain timestamp, a certain, uh, a certain, a certain um, um, tag um, so that they can actually be um, imported in the local data set. And the big problem is because there is no central truth that changes can actually occur in, in, in not in the, in the order that they are actually, so they can arrive um, in, in any order, not in that order that the user actually 
um, um, applied those changes to the data set. So for example, when a user creates a new object or a new calendar entry and then alters the, the title or alters the time that is tied to that event, um, every change is create, uh, every change has its own transaction log. And so, therefore, a transaction log about a change title can occur on one device, can arrive on one device, um, even that device does not even know that this event is there, because the creation of that event actually arrives later. And that's the freaky thing about that. And um, there are approaches like vector clocks. Um, that are used by, for example, there's a, a popular to-do app on the iOS and OS X platform. Um, it's clear. This is a, a, a to-do uh, list app, a, a productivity app, and uh, it uses a uh, it uses this asynchronous peer-to-peer -peer synchronization to sync up the list and to sync up data. And um, they use uh, uh, vector clocks in order to give timestamps um, to uh, to transaction logs to changed objects. And those vector clock thing is, is actually, if you're interested, there's a link in the description below um, where RealMac, which is the developer of Clear, and um, they describe how this thing all works and why it is very important. So basically vector clocks are, are like logic clocks. So they are not, these are not timestamps that are actually based on time, but on logic. And um, so the app always knows if then is a change that is missing. So for example, the creation of the event. Um, when they see a change to uh, a certain event in the calendar, um, um, by that timestamp, which is provided by that vector clock, you can actually see that there has to be another event um, that is missing. And so therefore, um, you can await and see that um, uh, that change that needs to be imported too. So this is really, it, it freaks me out, it's complicated, I can't really describe this how, if you're really interested in that, check that link out below. Um, this is really, really, it, it actually freaks me out. I don't get it really, so I can't explain it that much. Um, but it's interesting because you have to think a lot of things through um, in order to make this work. And as I told you, the big advantage of this kind of sync, of that peer-to-peer -peer, um, asynchronous sync, Asynchronous synchronization is that it's it's backend um, agnostic, so you can have any vendor you want. So you can even use a, a USB drive, for example, um, to sync devices. Um, yeah, so that's it for today. I just wanted to give you a quick overview. So there's a, a link to the to the article about the data synchronization below there, and there's a link to the article um, of that vector clock thing, which is kind of freaky. If you're interested, check it out. And um, so, yeah, that's it for today. This was this week's episode of Ashes to Me. Um, thank you very much for tuning in, and uh, see you next week. Hey guys, what's up? My name is Flori, and this is Ashes to Me.